Last uh, week I started preaching through the book of Nehemiah, just started on Nehemiah chapter 1, and this week I would like to, to continue on from there. And so feel free to follow along with me in your Bibles. I'm um, going to be uh, covering Nehemiah chapter 2 today. Um, I'll have it up there as well. I know that's probably a little bit small, but if you're able to read that, feel free to, to read that with me, um, starting at the first uh, portion there. Nehemiah chapter 1. Um, we're going to just look at the last few verses there in Nehemiah chapter 1 as a bit of a refresher before we get into chapter 2. Um, but Nehemiah chapter 1, uh, Nehemiah ends with a prayer. And one of the things we were really blessed in seeing in Nehemiah's life is a heart of prayer. Um, and, and he was a prayer warrior. So at the end of chapter 1, he prays this. He says, O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. So Nehemiah, as he's about to approach the king, as he wants to share this, this burden that God has placed on his life as he considers Jerusalem, how Jerusalem was destroyed, how its gates were broken down, its walls were collapsed and in need of being restored. He has this big weight on his chest that, he, that God has put on there, that burden for his people. He seeks God in prayer and he says, God, would you grant me success in the sight of this man, this king that he was about to present his request to? And so, Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 2, starting at verse 1. It says, In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the, the wine and I gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. And I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight and you will send me to Judah to the city of my father's graves that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah, in a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for, what I asked for the good hand of my God was upon me. <clears throat> when, we, when we look at this, this scripture passage here, I'm, I'm always blessed as I look at the word of God, how how there's details within the text that help us to appreciate and understand some of the events that happened behind the scene here. Remember, we just finished reading Nehemiah chapter 1, the, the last section there, where Nehemiah prays to God and he says, God, would you give me success? Because he, he recognized that if an answer to prayer would come, it would come from the hand of God. And so, <clears throat> when chapter 2 unfolds, you might think, okay, here's the next day, or here's maybe the same day. And we have a, an interesting um, word there in the, in the text. He says, in the month of Nis Nisan. Remember, when we started reading chapter 1, he was talking about the month of Chislev, which was like mid-November to mid-December in the Jewish calendar. And so... The, the month of Nisan is, is about four months later. 
So Nehemiah chapter 1 ends, and then there's about a four-month period before chapter 2 starts, which is interesting to note. And so one of the things we, we know and believe as we look at Nehemiah's life is that as a man of prayer, it seems he must have spent about four months waiting upon God. You know, sometimes we, we expect God to answer immediately or we, or we don't understand this waiting process, this waiting for God's timing. And so one of the things we can appreciate about the character of Nehemiah is that this heavy burden that God had put on his heart to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, he didn't take it lightly. And he knew that if he was to succeed in accomplishing God's will, he would need God to intervene. And so I believe that he must have, on a daily basis, he must have, he must have sought the Lord. He must have said, God, is today the day? Lord, today, would you open the door today? Is it possible that, that maybe the conversation in the throne room will, will um, lead us to a place where I'll have an open door today to talk to the king about my plans. But he didn't rush into this. He didn't prematurely just blurt out whatever he thought he should do. He, he spends time waiting upon God for God's perfect timing. And, and it's beautiful for us to just see this here, that there was a four-month period. God had put this burden on his heart, and now there was a, a waiting process for him to, to not go before God, but to allow God to, to um, supernaturally intervene and, and to uh, provide the right timing here. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, uh, we, when we read about some of these heroes of the faith um, that, 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 that Hebrews often talks about, the encouragement there is to be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I want you to notice that. Through faith and patience. Think perhaps of men like <clears throat> Moses and Abraham. Moses had been, had been revealed to him that he would be a deliverer for the nation of Israel. And as history tells us, as scripture tells us, he, he entered the wilderness at the age of 40, and he spent about 40 years in the wilderness before God finally raised them up and sent them back into Egypt to, to rescue the children of Israel. That's, a, that's a, a lengthy waiting period, and waiting upon God. Remember Abraham, who was told, you know, God took him out into the, the, the evening sky and said, look at the stars. All your descendants will be more numerous than the stars of, of, of the sky. And Abraham was an old man. Had, had one child and it took a process and it took difficulty but God eventually gave him his promise one of the things that I <clears throat> believe we, we all need to recognize over and over again is that, that God's timing is perfect when God's timing is perfect when God opens up a door no man can shut that door that's why in, in our world in Christianity today, there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of things that aren't happening because sometimes we just rush through. Sometimes we, sometimes we, um, manip we, we attempt to manipulate God. You ever heard someone um, say things like this? Well, if it's God's will, then this is what we're going to do. God's going to open the door. And then you, you hear an event has happened in their life and, and the door has been closed. And then three weeks later, they're again saying, well, if it's the Lord's will, then this is what we're going to do. And they do the same thing again. And God closes the door again. And then all of a sudden, on the fourth try, some, suddenly it works. And my question often is in a circumstance like that, did God really open the door or did you barge through a door that God meant for, to be closed. And, and then often that's the case. 
and people deal with the chaos and the circumstances that come from living a life that is not under the will of God. And so this, this story here in Nehemiah is an incredible example to us of when we wait upon God's timing, God causes things to work out really, really well um, according to his will. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. God wants us to, to, to rest in him, to wait upon him, and trust that he will open the doors. Notice how he says in verse 10 here, he says, Now I had not been sad in his presence before. So remember here is a, a four-month gap with this heavy weight upon Nehemiah. And all of a sudden, there comes a day where he's standing before the king as the king's cupbearer. And he had, I, I, I'm not sure what, what happened to his countenance during this four-month time. Maybe God divinely kept the, the king's eyes from seeing the burden in his heart. But all of a sudden, just at the right moment, the king noticed, he looks at Nehemiah and he notices something. And he says to Nehemiah, he says, hey, hey, what's going on? You're in my presence here today and your face is sad. You're not sick. This is, this is an emotional pain. This is a sadness of the heart. It says, then Nehemiah was very much afraid because, um, as, as we know from history, the eastern monarchs, they had, they had incredible sovereign authority over their kingdoms and and, if, and they had the authority, if somebody was sad in their presence and they didn't like it, they could execute a person like that. It didn't matter what kind of position they had. So it says here that he was very much afraid, and I said to the king, let the king live forever. <clears throat> when, we, when we think of that, that, that day in that hour, one of the things that I believe with all my heart is that here was a moment where God had opened up the heart of a king. Biblical scholars tell us that it was probably this same king, Artaxerxes, who, who stopped the work in Jerusalem in the book of Ezra. If you, if, if you go to, to um, Ezra chapter 4, you'll see there that the king, the Persian king during that time, stopped work that was going on in Jerusalem because reports had come back to him that, that this was a rebellious nation. They wouldn't pay their taxes. They, they would cause all kinds of uprisings. And so, so um, he put a stop to work there. So it's interesting to think of this situation that Nehemiah finds himself in. And in some ways, it's incredibly um, daring and courageous of him to even make a request like this. It's, it's really neat. But he responds in great wisdom. He, he responds with a question. And he endeavors to help the king to see what is going on in his own heart. And so he, he says to the king, he says, Hey, why should I not be sad? And I, and I believe that Nehemiah had been looking for a sign, had been looking for something that would convince him that today was the day, that the, the open door had come. And so he, instead of answering the king, he asked the, the king a question. And he leads the king into a place where the king can identify and feel with him. He says, why should I not be sad when, when the city, the place of my father's grave, my ancestry, my, my home country, my hometown, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Psalm 21 verse 1 says that the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord and he turns it wherever he will. Isn't that an incredible thought? 
The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. I know that sovereign authorities, even today um, on the earth, they, they believe that you know, nobody can thwart their plans and their directions. And, and we know that God in heaven um, uh, laughs at that. Scripture tells us that he laughs at that and, and that the nations are like a drop in a bucket. When, when people um, have this small-minded idea that everything on earth is unseen by a sovereign God above, it's, it's, it's a tiny way of thinking. It's being very small-minded when, when we think that way. God can turn the heart of a king. God is able to, to change directions in empires and kingdoms and throughout history... We've seen superpowers crumble. We've seen small nations rise up and defeat big ones. Um, God is able to change the direction, even the political climate of a nation, if he so chooses. So one of the things that we see here is that at just the right moment in Nehemiah's life, at just the right moment in the king's life, God causes the king that day when he could have executed Nehemiah for his sadness he causes the king to, to have a friendly, open response to identify with Nehemiah, to consider what's going on in Jerusalem, and to have a favorable response. I like what um, G. Campbell Morgan says about waiting for God in his perfect timing in this particular area. He says this, he says, Waiting for God is not laziness. It's not doing nothing. You know, during this four-month period... Nehemiah wasn't doing nothing. He was seeking God. He was, saying, he was pleading with God to open a door, to give an opportunity, but he didn't rush ahead of God. He waited for the perfect time. So he says, waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means first, activity under command. Second, readiness for any new command that may come. And third, the ability to do nothing until the command is given. I love that thought. You see, as, as people, we're, we're very restless. Do you ever, you ever observe our own Mennonite people? You know, we, we're always thinking the grass is greener on the other side. Why do you think Mennonites are so nomadic? I mean, look at our history. We've moved from Russia to Canada to Mexico to Belize to Paraguay to Bolivia and always in search of the new promised land, right? Um, you know, we, we, we sit in a nation for a while and we're like, oh, you know, I heard it's good over there. I'm going to go over there. We, we have this restlessness. When often God might say, you know what? Why don't you stay planted? And I'm going to cause you to succeed where you are. But anyways, I, I like what G. Campbell Morgan says here. He says, he says, this waiting upon God is even the ability to do nothing until the command is given. Willing to, to you know, I'm not advocating here for complacency or, or, or being passive in, in our Christianity. But I'm saying that during these moments where we're waiting for God to direct us, to open a door for us, let's not try to break down the door. Let's, let's wait and see what God wants to do with us. Remember, Moses waited 40 years. Remember how long Abraham waited. Nehemiah here waits four months till God opens this door for him. So then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. What a question, eh? Like I said earlier, I, I honestly think Nehemiah was, was looking and waiting for certain responses to come out of the king's mouth. And the response after response was telling him, 
this is the door I've been opening up for you, Nehemiah. This is, this is the way. Take advantage of the opportunity. In a sense, the, the king was saying, here's a blank check. He was so moved. He, he was saying to Nehemiah, what do you want? What are you requesting? Can you imagine a king saying something like this to you? What would you ask for? What would you say in a situation like this? Nehemiah was prepared. Remember, um, he had spent four months. And, and notice, notice what it says here. Ne- uh, the king asked him this. And so Nehemiah immediately prays to the God of heaven. One of the things we, we know is that his prayer was very, very short. You know, scholars tell us that if he had delayed too long when the king asked him, the king would have suspected treason or, or a conspiracy. So he just, he says a quick emergency prayer. He says, Lord, help me. Lord, give me the right words. And then he launches into his request. I don't know if you guys ever practice these things, but one of the things we ought to, to realize is that, um, I think it's in Thessalonians where it tells us that we ought not to cease praying. Our, our lifestyle ought to be one of continual prayer. And, but there's times in our life where, where we shoot out an emergency prayer to God, and, and that's fitting. We should do that. You ever been driving down the road in the wintertime and you hit a patch of ice? And your car starts to do things it shouldn't do. And you're like, God, help me. Oh, God. That's, that's an emergency prayer. Um, I know sometimes I've, uh, I've met with people, um, you know, dealing with relational problems in, in, in my office. And, and I know sometimes somebody lays out something in front of me and I'm like, just so you guys know, I, I'm just like you. I'm just an ordinary guy. And, and sometimes somebody lays before me a situation that I'm, I don't know how to help you. God, you know. Or God, would you give me the words? Just, just right now. To be able to share with this couple or this, or this person. And, and that's, that's a quick emergency prayer. And I would encourage you guys too. If you have an opportunity, maybe, maybe in your workplace, somebody mentioned something about Eternity or death or something. And, and you may not have time to get on your knees and spend 10 minutes in prayer. You can just shout out to God, God help me, give me the words. And that's, that's what he's doing here. Lord, help me. One of the things we ought to realize though is that emergency prayer, it doesn't take the substitute of, of spending devotional, deep, intimate prayer with the Lord. And one of the things we know here is that Nehemiah had four months of prayer preparation. And so he just, he just shoots out this emergency prayer. He wanted his response to come out just right. One of the things that, that we should always ask the Lord for before we, we um, launch out on a request or a petition or something um, when God opens this door for us like he does to Nehemiah, we should be willing to say, like Psalm 141, verse 3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. I mean, how often haven't we shared something or said something that has cut somebody up, that has hurt somebody, that, is, that, that we wish a thousand times over that we could take back? So often... And you know, James talks about this, that our tongue is, is, is so lethal and so powerful that it can set a forest on fire. You know, most of us already know that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure almost every one of us can think of a time in our own life where, where we maybe participated in gossip, where, where maybe we said something about somebody to somebody that we had no business sharing and it comes back on us and, and somebody comes to us with a hurt, um, expression and, and hurt feelings and says, hey, why did you share something that I shared with you in confidence? And so, we always ought to ask the Lord to, to guide us in our speech, even like Nehemiah does here. 
Proverbs 29, verse 20 says, Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. Meaning either for good or evil. You're, you're going to participate in the fruit of your tongue. And you're going to reap either death or life according to the words that come out of your mouth. So we ought, to, <clears throat> we ought to consider what Nehemiah did here. Lord, help me to formulate my words in such a way that they would honor you. I know here in the church, we, we talk about it as, as elders often. Like before we come up and share the word, we, we pray and we say, Lord, please keep me from saying something that I ought not to say. And Lord, help me to say those things that would build up your, your believers, that would edify them. <clears throat> but let's go on here. He, um, he makes this request now to the king. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. <clears throat> and the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the walls of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. I want you to notice something. <clears throat> In his response... He maintains his respect for the king. Notice how he says, if it pleases the king. If it pleases the king. You know, I, I'm in your hands, king. He, he, he's kind of saying this. I, I know you could deny me. You could do whatever you want with my request. But if it would please you, king, this is my request. And so he, he proceeds with his request. And I want you just to notice, he didn't, he didn't just on a whim share, you know, think, oh, okay, this is what I'm going to say to the king. He had four months to plan how he would respond if the king were to ask him a question like this. You know, sometimes I, I think we, in our own carelessness, we, we take the scripture passage that says, you know, don't prepare uh, for, for those who, who haul you before the magistrates, you know, I will give you an answer at that time. And so um, people practice this in every area of their life. They're like, you know, somebody's asked me to preach a sermon. Um, I'm just going to trust that God will give me the words when I, when I get in front of the people. And we don't plan. Or, or if um, somebody asks you to share a Sunday school lesson, you're like, yeah, I'm just going to kind of wing it. You know, there, there's so much of that happening in Christianity that that people can read through it. They can understand that, oh, here's somebody who hasn't really invested into it. And it's because of that, I think, often that people lose interest. And I'm not saying that God can't intervene, but God delights in the one who seeks him and then also plans and prepares. God is a God of order. He's not a God of confusion. And so Nehemiah's response was, was well thought out. <clears throat> Notice what he asked for. He asked for, for letters to be given to him. He had already thought of this. He had thought, if I travel from Susa the palace towards Jerusalem, I'm going to go through dangerous territory. And I'm going to go through places where people are not going to want me to go through. And as a result, I may not be able to accomplish God's work. So he asked for letters which served kind of like a passport does to us today. And so these letters got him through. The, the king asked him how long he would be gone. He has a, a perfect response. It seems like uh, the first time he went, he was gone for about 12 years. I don't know if he said 12 years to the king, but whatever he said to the king, the king was pleased with his answer. So he thought of those things. I had given him a time. And then he, he even does enough research during this time to know who the name of the keeper of the forest would be 
in that region there so that he could make his request in that, that everything would be provided. You know, I'm, I'm so blessed when I see God move people in the church here like that too. I know there's people on our board of trustees who are in charge of the building here and are working on the permit for our addition here. And they've had to make sure all their I's are dotted, all their T's are crossed, and, and, and then they go and present these things. It's, it's kind of like this. You know, planning thoroughly so you don't have to do things twice or three times or four times. <clears throat> that's, that's what he does here. And, and he thinks of everything. He thinks of security. He thinks of provision. And he thinks of resources. This is, this is really neat to see. And it says, And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. The king gave me everything I asked for. That's what he's saying, right? The king gave me everything I asked for. And then Nehemiah says, <clears throat> here's the reason. God opened the door. The hand of God was upon me. When the hand of God is upon us, when God opens doors, he makes our journey, he makes our um, project, our direction, our vision successful. So says, then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river, and I gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. This is an interesting verse too, and I don't want you to miss it. Because remember Nehemiah asks for letters, he gives the king the time that he's going to be gone. He asks for the resources, the provision, but he never asks for a security detail. And so this is another evidence when you wait upon God's perfect timing, when he makes this petition, the king provides him even with officers of the army and horsemen. A security detail to, to guide him all the way through that journey from Susa all the way to Jerusalem. And it was a, um, a journey that took many, many weeks. It was a long journey. I just think that's a blessing to, to know. When God is in it, um, you see not only doors opening, you see above and beyond what we would even think. It says, But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. And one of the things that we always realize is that when God is about to begin a good work, the enemies of God will always oppose it. I don't know what these men had in the area, but maybe they had some kind of financial boon they were getting. Maybe through some, some corruption, they were, they were able to build their own financial empires. Um, but either way, when they seen somebody had come from the king, it, it probably filled them with fear. It probably gave them a realization, something's going to change here. And, and they resisted it. And it's a little bit like when you give your heart over to the Lord. When you give your heart over to the Lord, but you've been serving the flesh and the enemy for years, the enemy does not want to give up his territory and will resist you and will often cause great trials in your life, great, great difficulties in your life so that he can try to hold on to you. And one of the things that we often see is if you as a believer prevail through those difficult times, that on the other side of that, there's great beauty that comes from ashes. There's great joy that comes from mourning. And so, one of the things that you ought to realize, if you today find yourself in a place of great spiritual warfare, of great resistance by the enemy, know that God is probably preparing and equipping you for a great work. Maybe you've been seeking Him about a calling that He's placed upon your life. But you are now looking at your life and you're like, you know, this is impossible. Everything I'm going through um, is not working out for me. And I would encourage you, hold on. Fight the good fight. Because on the other side of the valley, the sun is shining. <clears throat> and then he says, so I went to Jerusalem 
and I was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night to, by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and I entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Notice that when he gets to Jerusalem, he doesn't immediately do anything. He, he stays for three days in Jerusalem. Remember, Nehemiah was a man of prayer. And I believe that he knew a great work was coming. And I believe he spent three days making sure that God was going to lead him and direct him and continue to open doors for him. You know, this is something that I, I think we are often missing in our own life. We want God to do great work in us, but often we don't take the time to seek him in prayer. Remember Martin Luther once said something like this. He said, I have so much to do today, I better spend at least three hours in prayer. <laughs> we, don't, we look at that and we're like, uh, that doesn't make sense. You have so much to do today. Shouldn't you hop to it and get right to work? But he recognized how much he needed God to guide his every hour of every day. And so Nehemiah is like this as well. Jesus was like this. Before he calls his 12 disciples um, to start his earthly ministry, the early church, he spends time in prayer. In, in Mark 1.35 even it says, and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed. And he went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And, and the people came looking for him, and they searched for him, and they said, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. Well, well, that didn't distract Jesus from going to his father and spending time in prayer before he was about to begin a good work. Let's not miss this. This great principle, this truth that we see in Nehemiah's life, this truth that we see in the life of Christ. Um, in, in, this, in this passage here, it says here that Nehemiah goes out at night. He says, I told no one what God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. Why do you think he didn't tell the, the, the Jewish people there what he had come to do? I think there's a few reasons, and, and one of them is because as a leader, he felt that God had placed upon him this burden. And maybe he felt like if he was about to tell all the people there what he was planning to do, they would have scoffed at him. They would have said, that's an impossibility. Nobody can do that. Have you seen the miles of walls that need to be built? Have you seen the mess? Have you seen how destroyed these things are? You know how often we allow the, the naysayers, the, the negative people, to keep us from doing a good work for the Lord? Oh, that's a monumental job. That's going to cost all kinds of money. <clears throat> and so then we just sit and, and twiddle our thumbs and do our own thing. And we're like, you know, I, I, I can never do much. I, I, it's just little old me. Um, and, and then we're, we become kind of like the servant in Jesus' parable that buries his talent in the sand. God expects big things out of his people. I mean, don't we brag about serving an extraordinary God? Don't we brag about serving the, the creator of the universe? God expects to do big things. But I, I wonder if Nehemiah kept things to himself because he didn't want to be discouraged. And he really wanted to go and assess things. And you just see great leadership um, character coming out of Nehemiah's life when it comes to these things. Um, 
You know, I, I think sometimes, uh, and I had this conversation with, with a few men the other day um, about um, how sometimes, even as dads, as, as, as leaders in our home, there, there's moments where we might be faced with a really tough circumstance. Maybe it's financially. But as a leader, sometimes we maybe don't share these things with our children. Maybe there's even times where we don't share something with our wife because we don't want her to be anxious or discouraged. And so sometimes we shoulder something in our burden ourselves because we know that God has placed this upon us to to carry out. And I'm not saying that this is how we should always live, but as leaders, sometimes it's lonely. Sometimes we shoulder something for a while and we seek God about it. We ask God to give wisdom and direction to these things before we share them with others. And Nehemiah does this. He, he, he goes to Jerusalem and he makes a thorough inspection of these walls. The, the Hebrew word there for this inspection means to inspect something carefully, to, to closely examine. It's similar to, to um, if you were to get wounded... And say you were operating a chainsaw and you cut into your leg. And you go to the emergency room. And, and now you have a doctor that's examining your wound. He, he's going to get right in there. He's going he's to look inside and he's going to... And it's going to hurt. But he wants to make sure that there's not infection. Or, or any dirt, any residue in there that will cause infection. This is, he thoroughly examines the wound. And, and this is the word that's used here in this passage. That Nehemiah goes into the city and he thoroughly examines the walls. He, he looks at the foundation. He looks at what needs to be done in the entire city. Um, how it could be fixed. What type of skill would be needed. What kind of equipment would be needed to rebuild it. Jesus practices something similar in Revelations chapter 2 and 3. I've just been reading through um, these chapters again. Remember when Jesus addresses the seven churches in the book of Revelation. He also, in, in a similar language, he examines the churches. And he goes to a church like Ephesus and he says, there's certain things I like about you. You, you hate the deeds of the, the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You, you're careful about protecting your church from false teaching. I commend you for that. And he says this to, to the Ephesians. And then he says, but as I'm examining you as a church, there's a, there's a problem within, within you that really bothers me. He says, you've left your first love. You don't love me like you did at the beginning. So he says, what I want you to do is repent. Go back to your relationship that you had with me at the beginning. And so he, he diagnoses the church. And he gives them a recipe on how they can resolve and repair. This is, in a sense, what Nehemiah was doing here. And just as I'm thinking about that, we, we also need to consider some of these things. Examining the teachings of others. Um, Paul commends the Bereans for doing this. They, it says there that they received the word with all eagerness. But they were more noble than the people in Thessalonica. They examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Which is what you ought to be doing. Whoever preaches from this pulpit, you ought to go home and you ought to look in your Bible and you ought to, or even here, we encourage you to open your Bibles. Look at the Word of God and see, is, is what Herman is saying, is, is this accurate? Is the Bible actually saying this? Is, is the message that is being conveyed Actually, according to the Word of God. And just so you guys know, you, we, have, we have some good elders serving here. Two of the elders here uh, came to me today and said, Are you preaching a prosperity gospel? They look looking at my title. <laughs> that God will make us prosper. Hey, so we have elders here that are willing to keep me accountable. I, I, I like that. And I said, well, you'll have to wait and see. But Thursday we have an elders meeting, so I, I don't know if uh, I'm going to be in trouble or not. But uh, it's good for us to do this. We need to examine 
Scripture. We should be willing to examine ourselves. Do you ever pray what David prayed in Psalm 139 where he says, Search me, O God. Do, do an examination in my heart like you did to the church at Ephesus. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We should be willing <clears throat> to ask the Lord to examine us. Because what matters more to us than being able to stand before the Lord one day in hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. Being able to stand before the Lord one day where, where he says, I know him. He's mine. I've written his name in my book of life. What is more precious than that? Don't we want Jesus to examine us? Don't we want to live a life that honors him in every way? But I, I know I need to wrap up here. Let's uh, just continue here. He, he does his thorough examination of these walls. He, he assesses the problem that needs to be repaired. And then he goes to the Jewish people and he says, You see the trouble we are in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we his servants will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. I want you to, to, to notice how he motivates them to work. He, he shows them, he says, look at the trouble we're in. Our holy city, the, the possession of our God lies in ruin. And he says, come let us build so that we would no longer suffer shame and, and mocking and ridicule. Hey, let's, let's restore what God has given us. But I want you to notice something else he does. He, he does this in chapter 1 already. When he makes his confession before God and he says, we have sinned with God. And, and he identifies himself with the people. And here he says, he says, um, you see the trouble we are in. Notice he doesn't say, I've seen the trouble you're in. You see the trouble we are in. Come, let us build. Let's do this together. I'm, I'm identifying with you here today. I'm, I'm not higher than you. I'm not better than you. Let's build together. We're in this trouble together. We're in this mess together. Let's build together. And then he has an opportunity to share with them his testimony. And he's able to let them know, you know what, I sought God for four months. And all of a sudden, at just the right moment, the king asked me why I was sad. And I prayed to God and God gave me a great response to the king. And the king gave me everything I wanted. Plus more. And here I am. All kinds of resources at my hand. All kinds of provisions here. God has done some great work. And so the response of the people is, let us rise up and build. You know, when, when we do things God's way, we are able to testify. We're able to share and let people know and say, well, listen, this is what God has done. You know, and, and, and this is what I, I'm confident about today as we're about to embark on a building edition here again. <clears throat> we have a legacy here at Lighthouse. It's not, it's not anything of ourselves, but it is a work of God. We have witnessed the Lord provide um, a gym, uh, that balcony upstairs, 
that foyer, the bathrooms, everything that you see here. When we first moved here in 2004, and by the way, uh, this weekend is the exact weekend that we moved here in 2004. It's incredible. First weekend in July. We, we moved here in 2004, 19 years ago. And we didn't have the stage here. We had a, the sanctuary with benches um, where we could sit on every Sunday and, and get all kinds of stained shirts because the, the peel was coming off on our shirts. And, you know, we, we, um, it was interesting. We didn't have any air conditioning in here. We, um, we had one little bathroom for men, one little bathroom for women. Uh, we had living quarters over there. It wasn't very usable. We didn't have Sunday school rooms that really function well. And, and yet, throughout the years, one of the, the mandates we had, and, and, and one of the things I was so blessed with Pastor Henry was his desire that we would not go to the bank, that we would trust in God. And I, I learned so many of these principles through, through Pastor Henry that, that he had this desire that we would Trust in God to provide and open doors just like Nehemiah here. And I can just say with confidence that, that in the, the 21 years or so that I've been a part of this church, I've seen God provide miraculously time and time and time again. As we waited upon God, God opened doors and God provided. And I know with confidence that if we do this again, that God will provide again. We don't need to go to the bank. We can trust in the Lord. And so in this particular instance here, um, we're also able to, to say to all of you like Nehemiah did, see what God did in the past? See how God opened doors? Why would we change our approach? And when the people heard it, they said, let us rise up and build. And then we see the enemies opposing the work of God. And I, and just like I said before, at the beginning of every great work, the enemy will often try to oppose it. We, we've seen that in our church too, over the years, how just before a great ministry, a great outreach, there's been moments of discouragement. There's been times where we've seen the enemy try to suppress and try to destroy. Um, Paul even said this about his ministry in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, he says, We wanted to come to you, but Satan hindered us. And so we need to remember, even here, in this particular instance, these, these men, they, they mock and ridicule, and they, they say to Nehemiah, What are you doing? Obviously, you're rebelling against the king. And remember that letters had been written to the king earlier, and the work had stopped because of the word rebellion. So they use the same language, threatening Nehemiah that, hey, this work's going to be stopped again. And I love Nehemiah's response. The God of heaven will make us prosper. God has opened the doors. He will make us prosper. He's begun a good work. He'll bring it to completion. This, is, this ought to be our attitude instead of allowing negativity and and pessimistic people to keep us from doing a good work. We ought to be compelled and, and, and blessed and moved like the people here. Let us rise up and build. Let us move forward. Oh, we know the enemies are going to try to come against us. We know there's the negative people that have everything critical to say. But we can respond like Nehemiah. The God of heaven will make us prosper. The God of heaven has opened the door. And when we wait for God's timing, we can emphatically, with total faith, we can say, the God of heaven will make us prosper. And we as servants will rise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. And I just want us to look at that a little bit more yet. Then I reply to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper. This is... This is the attitude that we need to have when facing opposition. 
when we know God has clearly opened the doors for us. Remember uh, Psalms 20 verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. You know, people around us, they, they, they can't raise their heads to see that there's a God in heaven. They can't raise their eyes. All they see is, is, is what's in front of their, their eyes. All they see is, is horizontally. They don't have the faith to look up and recognize there's actually a sovereign God who controls every single thing. He, he knows everything. He has a future plan. And that plan is going to be worked out. So other people trust in chariots. Other people trust in armies. Earthly armies. But he says, not us. We trust in the name of the Lord. We trust in the name of the Lord. It's God who will make us prosper. This is the same thought David has in 1 Samuel 17. When this giant is facing this giant Goliath is facing the armies of Israel. And he, and he says, he comes upon the scene as a, as a young man. And he hears this giant taunting the nations of Israel and all the Israelite armies. All they see is the giant. And David says, who is this guy? This uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. What are you guys doing? This young man, filled with faith in, in God, said, you guys are quaking in front of this, this giant because all you see is with your earthly vision. He says, get beyond it and look at the God who causes us to, to prosper. This guy's defying the armies of the living God. And so he, he um, through these, uh, some circumstances, he, he finds himself in front of Goliath. This young man in front of this giant. And this giant uh, is looking at David and he's like, like, who are you, you know, uh, the, as a dog coming out to me. And, and David says this to him. He says, I got a message for you. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Talk about perspective. All you got is, is earthly stuff. All you got is, is metal. Guess what I have? I got the God of the armies of Israel, the, the, the hosts of the Lord on my side. David didn't feel inferior. David didn't feel outmatched. In, in fact... If you would read into this a bit more, you would almost think he felt sorry for this child. You know, when I think of that, I would like to ask you to take that perspective into life. But learn from Nehemiah's life. He sought the Lord. He waited upon God's timing. God opened the door for him. And when God opened the door for him, he was sure of success. He knew he would have success. And so he could confidently go to Jerusalem. He could encourage the believers. He could inspect the walls. And then he could testify what God had done. And regardless of any opposition, he could say, the ones on our side are more than the ones on their side. Our God is bigger. Our God is able. Our God, look what he's done. And I don't know what circumstances you're facing, but maybe you are dealing with a difficult spouse or a difficult family situation or a difficult workplace. And maybe a project that you are involved in looks impossible. But if you can take these principles into that situation and you can trust in God. God's perspective in the, the sovereignty of God. Take God into that situation. Don't go before God. Wait upon Him. Allow Him to open doors for you. And God will make you prosper. God will make the direction that He has called you to, to prosper 
and to succeed according to his will. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for Nehemiah's life. Thank you, Lord, for this perspective. Father, may we, may we practice this on a daily basis. May we know you. May we know your plan for us. May we wait upon your timing. Father, I want to pray for each person here today. I ask that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them understanding, that you would reveal your will. Father, give each one of us the patience to wait upon you, even like Moses and Abraham did, like Nehemiah does here. Father, may we wait upon you. May we trust in, in you, Lord, for your perfect timing. And then when you open the door, Father, may we give you glory. and May we let all the world know who it is that has led us, who it is that is building, who it is that deserves all the glory. Father, you do. There's nothing about us, Lord. But Father, all glory and praise belong to you. And Father, we look to you for every direction, every plan that comes our way. May we May we surrender. May we be yielded to you, Lord. Father, keep us from going astray. Put a guard over our lips, Lord. Guide us as we speak. Guide us as we live our life that we would be able to let other people know, yes, God opened doors for us. Yes, God directed. Yes, God worked amazing miracles. Lord, you're a big God. And I know you you delight in having your name glorified throughout all the earth. May our life and our testimony be such so that people could glorify God when they witness your hand upon our lives as well. In Jesus' name, amen.